I think we'll go ahead and get started at this time. So on behalf of the 2017 training course in maternal and child health epidemiology, welcome. My name is Maureen Fitzgerald, City Match staff lead for the course. On behalf of the CDC's Division of Reproductive Health, HRSA's Maternal and Child Health Bureau, and City Match, I'd like to welcome all of our 2017 course participants back, as well as some additional participants on this call. Participants on the course, you're here today to um, learn a lot in the first of two post-course webinars, uh, Knowledge Translation, presented by Dr. Patricia Pat Ocampo. Her bio sketch was included in your registration materials. Um, course participants, your next webinar will be the same time, uh, October 12th, and you'll be receiving information from UIC on that webinar. Because we have a few new participants, I think we should spend a moment walking through our usual housekeeping and webinar process. First of all, audio portion. Um, the webinar does begin with all the phone lines muted, um, even our co-presenters. Um, in this case, I think Pat's already unmuted her phone. And um, when Pat gets started, she'll let you know if she prefers to take questions as she goes or wait until a Q&A period at the end. If you need to unmute your phone to ask a question, press star seven. When you're done presenting or asking a question, press star six. That will remute your, re your phone. So again, star seven is how you unmute so you can ask a question. Star six is how you remute. And if there's any time that our presenter wants us to unmute all of the lines for open dialogue, we'll give you a heads up so that um, in case any of you are in um, conference rooms where you have a, a large number of people, you can have a second to kind of come to quiet. Chat box. Um, at the bottom left, there's a participant feedback box where you can key in a question and select who you want it directed to. Um, to me or to Dr. Ocampo. I'll be monitoring that box. Pat will look at those questions as she is able, and we can work through those um, during question and answer. Pat may suggest at certain points for you to unmute your phone for feedback or to work with that question. If you have logistical or technical questions, please send those to me via chat box. Third, hold. Please, as you all are aware by now, probably don't put the phone or the webinar on hold at any time because that shares your beautiful music or whatever is, is in your hold um, on, your, on your phone line with the entire group and makes it impossible to hear. So if you have to step out, just keep your phone muted or feel free to disconnect your phone line and call back in. We've got the beeps silenced, so there's going to be no beeping if people bop in and out of the call webinar. Last connections, if for some reason you are disconnected via the web or the phone, simply redial your phone, log in online, and rejoin. Again, it will be transparent. There's, there's no sounds and beeps. So that's it for housekeeping. And at this time, I would like to gratefully welcome Dr. Pat Ocampo to open the webinar. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Maureen, somebody asked if there was a number for audio, uh, and I wasn't able to respond, but maybe you can on the questions area. Ah. Um, great to be um, with I can, everybody. I can tell you that that was in the registration email, and I can also just put it down. I'll do a broadcast email to the full group. Oh, she said that she just received the email, so, but great. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, so, uh, hi, everyone. I uh, hope you had a great summer. Um, uh, welcome back and welcome to the new folks. I will say that I will look at the uh, questions that might be posed in the chat box area, but about halfway through uh, there will be an opportunity to ask some questions and then at the end, of course. Um, so let's get started then. We are going to be talking about knowledge translation for two um, sessions and this session is going to be the introduction to key concepts and activities. Uh, okay, so the um, overview then, let me see if I'm, there we go. What we're going to be talking about today is um, what is knowledge translation and why should epidemiologists know about it? Uh, and uh, there's different types of 
Knowledge Translation, or KT, uh, and the benefits of each, and then how might the different types of KT fit into your own work? Um, three big issues uh, that we could actually cover each one of these in a single topic. So I'm going to try and give you a good overview so that uh, you can begin to think about how this applies to your work. And for the second session, we'll go a little bit deeper on the 12th. Okay, let's get started. So. Um, because there's a few new folks there, um, I'm going to do a little bit of not quite an intro, but to let everybody know that um, I am an epidemiologist like many, if not all of you. I was trained as an epidemiologist, and as an epidemiologist, my training focused a lot on methods um, and how to do methods well and not so much on how I can use my research to make an impact. So that was one of the limitations of my training. I don't know if your training was any different. Um, and uh, because it was limited, I had to learn some of the skills of knowledge translation myself. And I needed to do that. Uh, and sorry, I'm going to go a little bit into more background on myself, but I think it's relevant because when I directed a Center for Research on Inner City Health, or a Center for Urban Health Solutions, as it's called now, it was our goal as a center to generate evidence that would address um, the growing urban health inequities that we've all been hearing about. And in order to do so, uh, I had to do much more than just apply the training in epidemiology that I got. So what I'm showing you here is the website from this Center for Urban Health Solutions. And we um, address a lot of issues in the Center. You can see here we address things like sexually transmitted diseases, um, uh, gaps in health care services, uh, issues of homelessness, uh, and looking at healthy policy. And actually, if you dig deeper in each of those, you'll see the specific projects for example, here we have um, improving services for people dealing with homelessness and housing instability. So we've got these projects here, and these are research projects. Everything we do is research, but our goal is to make sure that that research has impact. And the idea is to make sure that the research has impact right away, not the average time. So many of you may be familiar with the Institute of Medicine report that suggests that it takes a long time for knowledge, on average, to have an impact. Uh, this is a quote from that Crossing the Quality Chasm, where it's suggesting that it takes 17 years for new, and this is health and medical knowledge, generated by randomized control trials to be incorporated into practice. And so um, we were also finding that it took a long time for our research to be taken up by those who can use it. So we uh, did several things in the center in order to make sure that our research had impact. So um, what did we do and how did we shorten the time from 17 years uh, to much shorter to maybe immediate impact? Well, we did four things. We made four specific changes in the direction in which our research in our center um, was going. Uh, so I'll describe them and then go into depth in two of them today. I think uh, people remember this uh, framework from the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health from the World Health Organization, which is the ways in which uh, health inequities are generated. Uh, we're talking about on the far right corner, we have health inequities. And health inequities are generated by, if you look at the bottom, the intermediary social determinants of health, and then the structural determinants of health, which are the causes of the causes. And so, um, this uh, was an important framework for us. And the kind of changes that we made um, were first, we made our focus on equity explicit. 
so that may sound really simple. Um, you know, we could just talk about health equity all the time, but I think it's important to be more specific than just talking about health equity. Uh, the other thing that we did is we increased our focus on the structural determinants of health. So um, in, uh, when we were in Florida, when I talked about the social determinants of health, I talked about how important it was to focus on the structural determinants because most of our research is actually focusing in the intermediary determinants of health. The third thing that we did is we moved from descriptive research to interventions research. So while we still do some describing of problems, because it's important, we have really shifted gears so that most of the work that we do is testing solutions. So we are the Center for Urban Health Solutions, and we're testing solutions. A lot of solutions are going to fail, and knowing sooner rather than later that these solutions aren't working is really important. It's as important as identifying those solutions which are successful. So we do a lot of research that's focusing on solutions. And then number four is we increased our focus on knowledge translation. We actively implemented a program of knowledge translation. So those were the four things that we did, and when we did those four things, we actually find that a lot of the research that we do, if not most of the research, actually has immediate impacts. Um, and that's what we want to do. We all want, we've all entered research, I think, because we want it to contribute to positive change, to improving population well-being. And uh, KT and these other activities were really important for us to be able to make that immediate impact. We couldn't just do KT alone. Um, we needed to have the right kind of evidence in order to um, have effective KT. So I'm going to be going into two topics today. I want to talk about the issue of equity, so you see some red stars on your slide now. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, the focus, making our focus on equity explicit, and then also I'm going to be talking about what knowledge translation is. Okay, so um, let's get going to talk about the issue number one here making our focus on equity explicit. Okay, um, so when we think about equity, I would have to say that often we just say the words equity, uh, health equity, we're working on health equity, but we rarely uh, define what we mean. And I think that that's a limitation because uh, uh, there's a lot of different definitions or approaches to dealing with equity and ways of defining equity and inequities. Um, and I think it would be important to be more explicit about what we're talking about. So um, one way to think about differences in equity is to think about vertical versus horizontal equity. I'm not sure that um, uh, you've been working with those terms, and I'll talk a little bit about them uh, in just one minute. Uh, so um, when we're talking about vertical and, uh, well, one thing we need to know is that um, when we talk about equality, that's not the same thing as talking about equity. Right? Um, equality somehow suggests that we're going to give um, everyone the same thing, almost like um, uh, giving everybody the same opportunity, right? Uh, uh, so we're talking about equity of opportunity here, uh, making sure that everyone has the same opportunity, and that's often what we refer to when we say equality. Everyone has the same chance, um, and, but that doesn't necessarily mean equity. So when we're talking about equality, giving everybody the same opportunity, um, we're talking about horizontal equity. Okay? So horizontal equity is 
like in this photo here, in this graphic, we're giving everybody the same size box in order to pick apples. And we can see that even if we're giving everybody the same opportunity with the same size box, not everybody is able to reach the fruit on the trees. If we're talking about vertical equity, though, we're acknowledging that some groups of individuals need more help than others. And so we give those individuals with greater need, greater resources. So you can see in this picture here, the shorter individuals get um, three stacks and the taller individuals get one. And so when you have vertical equity, you're taking into consideration the differential needs of populations. And so this gives you one idea of why when we're talking about equity, it would be better if we were clear. We can be clear in two senses when we're, even when we're doing analyses. We can say that we're taking a vertical equity approach trying to demonstrate whether or not different subgroups have different unique needs, um, or maybe we're talking about equity of opportunity. So we want to make sure, uh, or we want to determine whether or not giving individual groups, subgroups, the same opportunity will make a difference. One thing to keep in mind is that there is uh, accumulating evidence to suggest that if you only focus on giving equal opportunity, that is horizontal equity, you have a good chance of increasing levels of inequality. Um, for the very reasons that's depicted in this uh, graphic here, if you give everybody the same opportunity, there are going to be some individuals who are left behind. And sometimes those subgroups can't catch up over time, or the inequalities and inequities get worse. So. In this slide here, it's showing more the reality of what the inequalities are, right? The growing gaps are, um, well, growing. So you can see on the far right um, panel, uh, the reality is that the inequalities are very big. And so you can imagine that if we focused on equal opportunity, giving all groups the same opportunity, that this might widen the gap. So when we're thinking about programs and even analyses, um, our programs and interventions and analyses are usually subscribing to one or the other of these views of equity. And we should be explicit about what we're trying to show or in our interventions, what type of equity the interventions are trying to address. So. Um, I am now going to talk a little bit about one of the attachments that I gave to you, uh, or two of the attachments, uh, or sorry, one of the attachments had uh, some worksheets in there. And um, I just want to walk through them, and maybe before we get to the next topic of introducing KT, I know it's taken me a while to get there, um, I may open the um, open the floor uh, or look at, the, um, look at the participant feedback chat box to see if you have any questions. But let me go through these worksheets uh, for a moment. So um, the worksheets, if you open up the worksheets, I think they're in order. I'm hoping that I put them in order. And I know that some of them are turned. I actually don't know how to fix that in PDF. So sorry about that. You'll have to rotate um, the, uh, um, the page. Uh, so the first one is really exploring the issue of health equity issues in my work. Um, so your work. This is your worksheet. And um, this is, uh, and again, these worksheets are really just meant to help you be a little more intentional in your work so that when you're describing your work to somebody else, because that's what happens with knowledge translation, you need to describe your findings, your work, your area. Um, you can do so with ease. Um, so uh, you might, uh, so this one is helping you to identify one of the issues that you're working on in health equity. 
I bet many of you are working on more than one issue. Um, so you might want to take one of those issues and really just describe it. How would you describe it to somebody? Um, I like to emphasize thinking about describing it in plain language, right? Because um, often your audiences, when you're doing KT, and we'll see this in a moment, they're not researchers. So if you start talking about you know, regression and adjustment and confounding and things like that, um, that's not going to be accessible language to many of the people you're going to be talking to about your work. So when you think about these worksheets, try, try and think about filling them out in a plain language way. Um, so uh, describe a health equity issue that really matters to you, that you focus on in your work. Um, and why do you care about this issue? I think that's really important to know. Often these issues uh, touch us uh, for a variety of reasons, and it's good to know why you care about this issue. And also, who's affected? What populations are we talking about? What populations in your local area, how are they affected um, and where? Uh, if you're talking about a state, are there differences across the state, for example? And then number C, if someone were to come to you who wanted to use your evidence and they wanted to get some expert advice based on the work that you've been doing, uh, and if you're like me, based on the many years of experiences that you've had, what kind of practical changes would you recommend uh, to reduce the inequality um, for this particular issue? Um, and you should be as specific as possible. You know, in some ways, you're acting as an expert in this case. Uh, now, you may not know what changes need to be made. That's okay, because um, you need to start where you are. Well, then how could you find out? Um, how could you find out what kind of changes are needed to address the inequities on this issue that you care about? You might want to ask somebody. So maybe instead of figuring out uh, or writing down in number C uh, what changes and policies need to happen, maybe you need to write down somebody's name who's been working in this area for a long time, so that you can become even more expert on this issue. So in number two, uh, this is really talking about in what ways do you want to contribute to this issue to see the changes, and how could the work that you're doing, your research, your epi research, help to bring about these changes and be specific as possible. So um, let's see, I'll give you an example. So my research, in my research, I am interested in the whole issue of gender inequities in health outcomes. Um, one area that I work on a lot is mental health. So um, I definitely care about this. I've been working on this issue for a very long time, uh, probably since uh, my, uh, since I graduated, which was a really long time ago. Um, and uh, I care about it because uh, I don't see a lot of improvement in the issue of mental health. In fact, I see it getting worse. And um, when I think about my work, um, number two here on this worksheet, you know, one thing I could do is something that I do a lot is in my analyses, in my epi analyses, I stratify by gender so that we can see what's going on um, and whether things are different for men and for women. But for one of my papers, I actually went further. Um, so I created these indicators of gender inequality at work. So for example, I was lucky enough to have data to look at gender inequalities for um, the same job title. So um, in the same job title, did women have more or less education and training than men? In the same job title, did women have more or less seniority? Did they have more or less pay? I bet you can guess what direction that went in. For the same job titles, women actually had more education and training. To me, that suggests that women um, had to prove themselves in order to get that job. They also had less seniority, so there were fewer senior managers um, in a particular area, and then women had less pay. So I was able to use that data to create gender inequality variables by job and then look at how that was related to mental health. Um, so that took some thinking on my part that I wanted to go beyond just stratifying my analyses by gender to demonstrate what the outcome of these 
processes of inequalities were. And I wanted to be able to document um, some of the inequalities that were contributing to these mental health outcomes. Okay, so hopefully that's um, um, an exa um, a understandable example of how this worksheet might help you. Remember, there are no right or wrong answers. These are answers for you to explore. So when you're working on these worksheets, if you choose to do so, um, write anything down. No one's going to be grading it. Let's go over one more worksheet. Uh, the next one is how can my evidence be used to advance health equity? So number one is about describing the kind of designs that you typically do. Are they cross-sectional? Are they longitudinal? Are you describing problems? Are you um, evaluating interventions? Um, so describe a little bit about what you do in number one. And then in number two, um, we're trying to bring out this explicit focus on equity. So does your work support vertical or horizontal equity, uh, typically? And can you look at both? Again, remember, there's not a right or wrong answer, but this is good for you to know about your work, the kind of equity that your work tends to focus on. And then number three, who could use that evidence uh, that you're generating? And how would they use it? And again, here is where a lot of epidemiologists um, may not know because we don't get trained in it. On the other hand, many of you are working already with people in your um, departments or in your organizations uh, that will be using your evidence. So you may know very well who's going to be using it. Um, so, and again, if you don't know, how could you find out? So this too is uh, an attempt to help you understand your work better, the nature of the evidence that you are working on and generating, and how it can be used effectively um, by individuals to make change. So at this point, we are just about halfway through. Um, I am going to, um, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about what I've talked about so far in terms of equity. Uh, before we get into the topic of knowledge translation or the worksheets, um, I'm going to take a quick look at the participant feedback chat to see if there are any questions. And if not, which I don't see that there are. Um, <laughs> not really, but if you want, would you? like me to remind folks about um, how to unmute? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. If anyone has any questions at this point, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, press star 7 to unmute your phone. That will individually unmute. And then press star 6 when you're all completed. All right, I am thinking that nobody has any questions. I'm not seeing anybody unmuting. There will be an opportunity at the end to ask questions if you have any then. So let's carry on then and talk about one of the second changes that um, we made to our research in order to increase impact. And this is about knowledge translation. Okay. Um, so knowledge translation, I'm going to share a definition with you. I'm sharing a definition from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research uh, because I think that they have done a good job of really exploring this topic quite a bit. Um, in Canada, when we write a grant, for example, we have to have a knowledge translation plan um, and uh, to make sure that our research is having an impact and uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research have uh, funded a lot of research on knowledge translation. So a lot of what I'm sharing with you is evidence-based. And so I'm going to use their definition, and I'm in no way suggesting that that's the only definition we should use, but I think it's a reasonable one to start with. 
Okay, knowledge translation. Um, knowledge translation, or KT, is a dynamic and iterative process that includes synthesis, dissemination, exchange, an ethically sound application of knowledge, and here we're talking about research findings, to improve the health of, it says Canadians here, but we're talking about to improve the health of populations. Um, also, the idea is it will not just improve the health of population, but it will improve interventions as well. So here, to provide more effective health services and products and strengthen the healthcare system, uh, we know that KT doesn't just happen within the healthcare system, so I would argue it goes beyond the healthcare system to other service settings as well to improve all programs we can use KT. So to continue, it says, this process takes place within a complex system of interactions between researchers and knowledge users. And these complex system of interactions may vary in intensity, in complexity, and the level of engagement, depending on the nature of the research and the findings, as well as the needs of the particular knowledge user. All right, that's a pretty good definition. I'm going to try and break that down for you now. Um, and by the way, there is a, um, there is, uh, I got this from a slide deck that was online, but there is a uh, knowledge translation guide uh, that you can get online uh, that was published by the CIHR, and it has a lot of information in there. Okay, so um, even though I just said the word knowledge translation, uh, there are many different words uh, that can be used, maybe interchangeably, with knowledge translation. I've just listed a few here, knowledge transfer, knowledge translation, knowledge transfer and exchange, knowledge to action, closing the no-do gap, linkage and exchange, knowledge mobilization. You can see the theme here. The idea is about taking evidence that we generate in our research and somehow moving it, mobilizing it, exchanging it with individuals who can use it. Um, and then closing the no-do gap is suggesting that we're using evidence to um, apply uh, to a particular circumstance so that we can um, uh, um, apply, uh, so that we can um, make available information about what is known. Um, so you get the idea. Uh, there's a review that suggests that there were over 100 terms identified that can be uh, describing KT-related processes. Uh, so that's the McKibben article. Uh, so I wanted to make you aware that while I'm using the words knowledge translation, you might have heard other terms for the same thing. I also want to call your attention to the idea that um, there's some critics of knowledge translation. So there is a different review that cautioned against the narrowness of the assumptions underlying this idea that we can take evidence and then make it available to the right people. And when we make it available to the right people, something great is going to happen and um, we will reduce inequities, okay? So the Green Hall paper, um, which talked about knowledge translation, um, is uh, critiquing the narrowness in the following way. So one is that there is this idea that the knowledge that we generate is absolutely objective. Um, that tends to be the case when we uh, hear about a lot of knowledge translation. Um, and that may not always be the case, that the knowledge that we're sharing um, is objective. So we have to be careful about that assumption. Um, a second critique is that uh, we can all identify this no-do gap. So the idea is we should be doing something and, for example, evidence-based um, 
uh, research or guidelines can help us make sure that we're doing the right thing and help us close this no-do gap. And it's suggesting then that what we need in order to close this gap can be solved with technological solutions. And in fact, we know that in some cases, it's not about having the right technological solutions or even the right evidence, that there's a lot of barriers that get in the way of doing the right thing, of applying evidence-based guidelines, for example. I'll give you an example of that. So I work in the area of intimate partner violence, and I work in the area specifically of trying to help clinics um, use uh, or, or um, implement uh, guidelines for doing routine screening for intimate partner violence in clinics. And uh, while there are evidence-based guidelines for that, there are a lot of um, barriers to implementing those guidelines. Some of it has to do with um, the way the clinic is run and whether providers are going to be allowed to devote time to screening and response, because it's not just about screening in this case. Once somebody says yes, then we're obliged to do something about it, and that can take time. But another barrier is that um, given the prevalence of partner violence, so for example, one in four women in her lifetime might experience violence, that many staff are experiencing violence and they haven't actually dealt with their own issues. So that's another barrier. So the idea that we, just, we have these evidence-based guidelines, let's implement them and it's as easy as that is often not the case. And so for number three, um, here we are. Practice is a set of rational decisions, potentially informed and improved by objective science. So again, that may not be uh, the case. Uh, and I've just given you an example that just because we have these evidence-based guidelines, it's not a matter of rational action that will enable us to implement those evidence-based guidelines easily. Uh, and I can tell you that's the case because for uh, almost 30 years these guidelines have existed. Okay, so we should also be cautious then about um, the assumptions underlying KT because they don't always apply. All right, so there are two types of KT. Uh, you can see in blue on this slide here, integrated KT research, that's a mouthful, and then end of grant KT is the second type. Um, I'm going to let you read uh, some of these definitions. I'll just briefly summarize that the integrated KT is a more active type of uh, set of activities requiring collaboration, direct collaboration with your knowledge users, that is, people who are going to use the evidence that you're working on. And uh, there are many ways to collaborate, and that's what integrated KT is about. And often that collaboration starts quite early. It could even start right before you even formulate your research question. The end of grant KT is something that I was definitely trained in and taught um, when I was an epidemiologist. It's about disseminating your findings once your research project is done. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about them in reverse order. I'm going to first talk about end of grant KT and then um, uh, integrated KT. But let me first talk about what a knowledge user is. So here you're going to have to turn your neck a little bit in order to see the definition of knowledge user. So knowledge users are all those individuals who might use or benefit from or be impacted by the results of your research, but are not necessarily involved in the production of research. Okay, So anyone who's impacted by your research whether it be the target population, whether it be program planners, whether it be funders, they are the knowledge users. And each project, even each analysis, might have different knowledge users. So 
look at this table here, and this comes, remember I referred to this guide that's online, a guide to knowledge translation. So they uh, produce this table here about possible knowledge users. This is not the universe of knowledge users, um, but this lists some possible knowledge users and kind of examples of the ways in which they might be engaged with or care about certain projects. So there's practitioners, for example, um, and they might care because the way in which they deliver treatment is often impacted by new guidelines and new evidence that comes out. There's obviously patients because they could potentially be receiving the best treatment known today. Um, and as patients, we all want that. Uh, so they are very much affected by our findings. Then there's patient organizations who often advocate on behalf of certain patients. So again, I don't, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I think you get the idea about who a potential knowledge user is. Um, okay, so uh, I'll let you read that. Um, oh, actually, I think you have access to the slide, so I don't have to stay here on this slide. If you want to stay on this slide yourself and read it some more, you can. Um, okay, so, uh, and thanks to those folks who are chatting and answering the questions for me. Um, okay, so as I mentioned before, there are two types of integrated KT, and I want to talk about end of grant KT first. That's why there's a red number one there. Here we go. So what are some ideas for dissemination? Okay, so um, there was a, um, a report called Knowledge, Knowledge Mobilization in the Social Sciences and Humanities, and this was uh, published in 2007, and this, um, uh, they had some great ideas for uh, dissemination of um, your research findings, okay? And again, I'll let you read this um, list here. I think many of us are familiar with publications and background papers. Uh, we often write those ourselves, especially when we have uh, findings that we want to share. Um, and background papers could also include reports. Um, and, uh, but there are many other ways in which we can share our products. Um, we could have a case study and publish that. We might write an editorial because there's a particular need in our research area for either different kinds of data or different kinds of consideration. We might share a fact sheet. Um, again, I'll let you read that. Uh, one of the things that we have done in the center is we've actually um, created something called a research flash. And the research flash used to come out maybe monthly, bi-monthly. And uh, because we had many papers coming out of our center, it was hard to keep track. So we would highlight four of them, two on the front and two on the back. It was a one-pager. And uh, we would not um, repeat the abstract, because the abstract of papers is often very academic uh, and inaccessible, but we would um, create a plain language description of the findings and why those findings mattered. They were wildly popular. We would often see um, our description of that research taken and then put into other people's newsletters. We were happy with that kind of plagiarism. Um, because it got the information out there, and we often got feedback that it was extremely useful. Uh, so there's different ways in which you can think about disseminating information. And uh, also, from the um, same source, uh, there are other ways, there are face-to-face um, -face ways to disseminate your findings. Uh, and there's certainly um, data to suggest that it's far more effective if you can come face to face with your knowledge user and interact with your findings or about your findings. First of all, they can ask you lots of questions and they can, um, you can explain it. And if you really care about the issue, remember the worksheets that we talked about just a while ago? 
if you really care about the issue, it will come through, and it's far more meaningful to your audience. Uh, so these are ways in which you can create opportunities for face-to-face -face meetings with uh, relevant knowledge users of your research. And again, I'll let you read these. Um, I think they are all fairly straightforward. Um, okay. So here is another worksheet, and um, oh, I see the. The font is a bit off, sorry about that. Uh, so what types of dissemination uh, fit your research? So the R is cut off there. Uh, and uh, these are some questions for you to answer for yourself so that you can begin to create a dissemination plan for your particular set of analyses. Again, probably each analysis or project that you're working on probably requires um, a unique dissemination plan. Um, but first, you need to figure out what kinds of findings do you want to share? Um, and uh, so you may not want to share everything about a particular project. Maybe there are highlights. Or it may be that different audiences care about different things. And then which stakeholders need to know about these research findings? Uh, and then how do these stakeholders ideally engage with these research findings? Some of them are going to be perfectly fine reading a newsletter and even reading the article. Because sometimes your stakeholders are other academics. So if that's the case, you don't really need to create a special newsletter for them. And then number four, what kinds of dissemination events are ideal for sharing these research findings? You may find that certain stakeholder groups need their own considerations, or you may find that you can lump different uh, stakeholder groups or knowledge users together. But this worksheet is intended to help you think about this um, and kind of get the creative juices flowing about how you want to disseminate your findings. So um, I'm aware of the time, and I have a few more things that I would like to say about this. Um, and I wanted to give you some examples. So uh, let's move to... Um, here we go. Let's move to integrated knowledge uh, translation. So integrated knowledge translation enables the research to be far more impactful compared to end of grant KT. And as I mentioned before, this is about engaging users or potential users of your knowledge early on. Now, what is integrated KT? Usually, the researchers and the knowledge users, or sometimes they're called knowledge creators. Um, but I don't really like that term because if you do integrated KT well, often everybody is creating or they're co-creating the knowledge. They can shape the research questions, interpret the study findings, and move the research results into practice. And um, this is the minimum requirement according to, um, uh, according to um, the CIHR uh, for integrated KT. Um, here I have a quote from one of our partners. We have many, many knowledge user partners. And when we do this kind of work, they really appreciate it. A couple things happen. One is that I, as a researcher, um, I learn a lot about what kind of evidence my knowledge users need. And um, often it's just a small part of my overall research project that they can use it that they really appreciate. But also I've built kind of the research literacy of many of my partners. They're much better at knowing what kind of evidence they need and want. Uh, and so um, it's kind of a win-win. So as I mentioned before, the minimum was the things here in gray. Shape the research question, interpret the study findings, and move the research into practice. But um, there's also additional activities that are important. So decide on the methodology, for example. Uh, some of your knowledge users can uh, decide on the methodology and what they need, or help with data collection or tool development or selection of the outcome measures, and then also help with the dissemination. 
I just want to walk you through some examples of how Integrated KT shaped the projects that I've been involved in. One example is there was a multi-site study, um, and they were mainly community organizations um, across the nation. They were analyzing these data at a local level, so they were taking national data and just analyzing the information from their own areas. And um, when we were all working together, or they were all working together, they decided uh, to really just pursue bivariate analyses and not multiple regression, in part because they felt more comfortable uh, for the local analysts and the organization felt that this would be good enough evidence for their initial purposes. So rather than quickly go to multivariate regression, which is something a researcher like me would do, they wanted to stop initially at bivariate analyses. Next example is a community partner is doing integrated KT in a homelessness study and decided to use the data from that study um, by uh, doing the initial subsample. So let's say that they were going to recruit 300 people, but when they had 150, they decided to do an analysis of those initial data, in part because they needed the information right away. They didn't have any information or access to that information from any other place. And they said 150 would be enough. We don't have to wait for the full sample and they decided to create a public report with the first half of the data. And again, that was the knowledge user saying, this is good enough for me. Next example is there's a multi-sector table um, was created to better understand the health and the social risks of all neighborhoods in the city. So there were many sectors there, education, um, health, public health, um, there was city planning urban planners. So um, we together did this project, um, and we were the researchers at the table, and once the data was analyzed but not yet made public, two of the partners had already used the findings to make changes in their own organizations in terms of the types of services they were delivering. And when the public report was issued, announcements about how these organizations had already taken action um, to improve population well-being were also part of the public announcement. So they didn't have to wait for the report to come out. They could immediately act on it because they were sitting at the table and they knew the findings right away. So again, these are all illustrations of how knowledge translation and integrated KT in particular can help um, shape projects and uh, knowledge users can take away from these projects what they need. Uh, just so you know, from all of these, academic papers also resulted, um, and they were different from the products that the knowledge users cared about. Sometimes integrated knowledge translation has been compared to partnered research. That's what PR is here. And you can get a sense of how partnered research goes beyond what integrated KT is described as here, for example, Issues of confidentiality are talked about often in partnered research. Um, there are often um, uh, issues about who owns the data, where you're going to hold the data, things like that, are things that are discussed in partnered research, which are often not necessarily discussed in IKT. It's not like it's not allowed, but this is just a way of comparing, because many of you are familiar with community partnered research. So I just wanted you to um, uh, have uh, kind of exposure to that. Um, okay, so I want to give you some practical examples. Um, so this example here, these are all now examples of integrated KT. Um, so in this example here, uh, this is a project where researchers, so I and my research team, we worked with uh, providers of social housing on uh, the intersection of violence against women and housing and housing stability. Uh, so when we worked together, we generated a number of reports 
uh, and um, we probably we work together to formulate the research questions. One of the research questions necessitated getting a grant. So as the research uh, portion of this partnership, we ended up writing a grant. Uh, and uh, getting the grant, uh, that, that took us a while, but it was an important question for us to answer together. Um, but the research in the end revealed a close link between housing instability and experiences of violence. I think we knew that intuitively, but this really documented with hard evidence that link. And then housing providers learned that tenants with experiences of violence are not more likely to be either evicted or in arrears with their rent compared to tenants who don't experience violence. And this was an important myth buster, um, especially for housing providers, because they were under the impression that if you've experienced violence, it's an added stress and you're going to be more likely to be a worse tenant, and they found that not to be true. Also, um, together we took the results on the road, and this helped to strengthen the collaborations across different sectors serving um, violence against women. What we heard over and over again when we took the show on the road was that these sectors don't often have an opportunity to just come together and chat uh, and to compare notes and to find out you know, what the updates are with the other sectors. So even though we were excited about sharing our results, um, many of the results they knew, some of the results were new, uh, but they had an opportunity to take that information and strengthen um, links. Okay, one more example. Um, this, was, this integrated KT project was about the types of programs and services that youth needed in a particular neighborhood. The neighborhood was called Weston Mount Dennis. So I'm showing you the cover page from this report. This was the playing language report of a project that used concept mapping. And um, so uh, we wanted to, um, th so the youth in this particular neighborhood, we were hearing from many service agencies that the youth, um, were, there was a high level of unemployment in this neighborhood, that youth had particular needs, um, that uh, there were many service providers who were coming together to say that they could try and assist in providing services to this youth but we knew that there was not a good solid needs assessment that had happened for youth in this neighborhood. So what did we do? I'm going to describe the things that are on the far right blue panel of this slide. So I already told you the purpose, which was to help newcomer youth. Well, maybe I didn't say newcomer youth. So these are um, youth from immigrant families and uh, we were hoping to help them be more successful in education and employment. The particular knowledge users for this project were the community itself, the neighborhood residents in Weston Mount Dennis, plus multiple service providers in the neighborhood and outside the neighborhood seeking to provide services to help youth. And so uh, the service providers themselves initiated this activity, and they invited research, that is me and my team, to the table to help them do this needs assessment. And um, at the end of this project, the impact was that we were able to articulate the needs of youth from multiple perspectives, because with our concept mapping, we asked the youth themselves, and we asked two different age groups of youth, very young youth, and then youth who were transitioning to adulthood, we asked their families, and we asked service providers. And what was interesting is that the, each of those groups provided different um, rankings of the kinds of services that they need. Oftentimes, we rely on service providers to tell us what their target population needs, and their perspectives were very different from the youth. So we were able to take the priorities from the youth themselves and identify the kinds of services that they needed and wanted. And what that resulted in, so that's the second bullet under impact, is that the service providers who were there decided that they weren't really needed. So one of the service providers who was ready to go with their service 
found that youth and many people ranked their particular service very low. And so they pulled out of the project. On the other hand, um, we were able to identify new service partners to meet the needs of youth, and those services were identified. So um, that's another example of how an integrated KT project um, was done, and who was involved, and how it was initiated, and how it ended up helping the population. OK, so here we have um, another worksheet. And I'll let you look at these questions. But this is um, kind of in your work. Um, what are the kinds of foci that you have? Do you talk about needs and gaps and prevalence? Or do you evaluate programs? Um, you probably do more than one, um, but identify as many as possible. And then um, how well does your focus on either the problems or the solutions align with the kind of changes that are necessary for that issue? This in many ways relates to the first worksheet that you were doing, because um, you were talking about what's needed in that area. And then um, given what is needed in terms of evidence, what steps can you take in your work to make your work more relevant to knowledge users? And then number four is, if you took these steps, would your work be more or less interesting, challenging, or rewarding to you? And again, these, there's no right answers. This is just to help you think about your work and how to make it more or less aligned with some of the knowledge users. You may find as a result of doing this that there's a certain knowledge user group you're not going to be targeting in the future. OK, so um, some messages for you are that uh, when you're developing your own KT priorities and approach, be intentional about your KT. Really think about um, who your audiences are, what they need, get to know them. Um, and there's probably more than one knowledge user for your work. So think about them all. Think about the needs of them all. Uh, develop your own mix of activities that reflect your own priorities, your own values, your own skills, and your desired impact. And then intentionally explore by creating a plan or a set of goals. And you can try out your strategies and throw them away or strengthen them if they work out well and revisit periodically. Maybe it's a developmental approach on your part. Uh, and then finally, some questions for you to think about are what matters to you, what impacts do you want to have, and what will you do differently to make sure that the evidence that you're generating has a greater and quicker impact. So that was my last slide. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions at this point, either through the chat or um, by having people unmute their microphones. I'll be happy to help in any way I can with this part. Please feel free to ask questions. Press star 7 on your phone to unmute. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Hi, this is Janice from Montana. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ocampo. I, as always, your presentations are fabulous. But um, I did have one question, and it goes back to the slide um, on integrated KT example number two, where um, a community partner doing integrated KT on homelessness on a homelessness study, decided to use data from a, a smaller subsample of the study and not wait for the full sample. So in a situation like that, isn't that potentially a little dangerous? Because what if that subsample uh, shows either a strengthened effect or an effect that's maybe not there or in the opposite direction um, by the time you get to the end of the report and all of the data collection and analysis? Um, yeah, you're asking a great question. As a researcher, you know, this idea gives me goosebumps for sure. Um, but I think as a responsible research partner, um, it would be your job to in fact say these things, to say, 
hey, let's think this through a little bit. If you use you know, the first half of the sample, what does that mean? Are we going to, for example, identify new recruitment areas for the second half of the sample so that, as you're pointing out, we might get a very different group of individuals who are contributing to the full sample? Um, uh, so we should think about that. Um, and when is you know giving advice from a researcher's perspective when a good time to do a sub sample analysis would be to be honest what happened is we decided to take a peek at the data and they were going to make a decision about whether or not to write a report based on the sub sample after taking a peek at the data and then um, we were also going to tend to some of those things that you mentioned so you know, will the second half of the sample be vastly different than the first half? Is there enough power to look at some of the things that they want to look at? So all of those things were considered. But in the end, as I mentioned, they had had no access to this particular kind of information, and they prioritized being able to publicize the needs of the population. Because for them, what it meant is, hey, maybe I can get um, access to money for these services a year earlier than I would have if I waited for the whole sample. So for the knowledge user partner in this case, for them, they needed money to meet the needs of their population. And to do that then, publicizing the results earlier rather than later was far more important for them. I'm hoping I'm answering your question. Right, yeah, yeah. And so um, you would probably in this situation want to urge them to include that caveat of we're still doing the research, um, but this is what it's showing so far, right. correct? And there's okay. sort of precedent for that in research. So there are, for example, randomized trials sometimes do an early analysis, right? Right. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for the question. Do we have another question? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. And I guess we will be speaking again in about 10 days. That is true. Thank you so much, Pat. This has been a wonderful presentation. I want to remind everyone that we do record and archive these. So if you did register for the call, you will be getting an email, once again, that has an evaluation we very much need you to complete. But also it will include um, a link to the archived recording of the audio and, and webinar portions. Also the worksheets and the PowerPoints, again, will be sent. So from all of us, Thank you very much and hope all of you have a great day. And thanks again, Dr. Ocampo. Marvelous. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. The conference has been muted. The conference has been unmuted.